Hello. This is loud. Um, so a lot of us have been hearing all about GDPR and the words GDPR, and we don't really know what it means. So do you want to <laughs> say what the actual acronym stands sure. for? Sure. So I, just before we even begin, I, kn I know that we want this to be conversational. So if anyone has questions, are you comfortable mm -hmm. with people jumping in? Please jump in at any time. Oh, cool. Better. Awesome. Perfect. Great. Um, so GDPR, which is a, a great acronym that stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, it's a new, well, we're going to dive into it a little bit. Um, so if you have specific questions, we can dive in even further. Um, it's my, been my experience that people tend to gloss over real quickly <laughs> when I start diving into the legal, legal um, the details. <laughs> so we'll keep it, keep it at a high level. Generally speaking, it replaced, um, replace the laws in Europe around um, how uh, companies and organizations need to process or handle personal information. Personal information is very broad. If you can, if anything that is uh, associated with an individual which is, who is either identified or possibly identifiable would be within the scope. It's a very broad law. It affects virtually every, every uh, business it, that's operating in Europe and maybe some that are not operating solely in Europe. Um, or even have operations in Europe. And uh, yes, it's everywhere. So, it's everywhere, it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so, two years ago, this law was signed into effect and everybody had two years to prep. We know it's coming, we should get ready. It's okay, we should get ready, but not everybody cared. Not everybody thought it applied to them uh, some companies are just like, sorry EU, you're just not going to be able to read our newspaper in your country anymore. And then others did, our, did their best, and this is one of those stories. Oh, so the GDPR, <laughs> this is just a high level crib sheet on what the GDPR is. Um, so just like I mentioned, it's a new law that expands the rights of the person, of people in the EU, of, uh, how they can, about um, how it expands their rights with regard to their personal information. Um, it applies to organizations that sell products and services to, in the EU, but also even to um, organizations that collect information about people in the EU. Um, so it's a broad reach of companies um, and organizations, I should say that too. Um, it, the enforcement started in May, which is why you probably received a million and a half emails up about updates to privacy policies or new terms and conditions or terms of service and all of that fun stuff. Um, some big things at a high level, just to keep in mind, and one of the reasons that, uh, and this is what I, I get brought in to uh, talk about it into it often, are why it matters. It matters, one, because there are really big penalties for non-compliance for a company like our company. Um, we're talking about the potential of maybe 4% of global turnover. That's millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of dollars if we get into trouble. For one incident. Yes, for, <laughs> yes, yes, and it, it's layered upon, uh, layered upon each other. Um, there are significant, so the new rights under the law, there's many, many of them. Some build upon old law, uh, old, old rights, and some are, are brand new. Um, these, from our experience, required a lot of uh, new operations to be put in place, new processes, new procedures, new user experiences. So it wasn't, there was a lot that we did on the legal side to um, improve our contracts and improve, um, uh, our relationships with regulators and our terms of service and our, our privacy policies and all those fun things, but also a lot of it had to do with how we thought about data within our organization, building the processes around um, how we strategized about data, about our processes um, and how we handled it, our access controls. Um, and so it really deeply affected the way our organization moves and will move in the future. Importantly, C, which I think is really important to this group of people, it, it, heavily, it will heavily influence the marketplace both today and moving in the future. And it's going to level set cultural expectations on how personal data can and should be used. What I have found is, that has been remarkable is um, some of the greatest user feedback that we've received about GDPR are actually not from Europeans. They're from Americans. They're from people in Canada. They're from people in Asia who expect now that the GDPR has been uh, applied in Europe, that they want the same rights too. And it's not fair if they're a user, even if they're in the United States and using a different product, it's not fair that someone else might have greater rights. And they expect, even if legally they couldn't you know, go to the government and ask for these rights, they expect us as stewards of their data to respect, respect uh, 
their privacy rights and um, possibly provide them with more rights than what the law would even allow. So has everybody gotten a lot of emails? Did anybody actually read any of those emails? No. And did anybody ever get anything via snail mail? Not so, a single, you, you didn't read my email, none of you, <laughs> not one person. <laughs> Feel hurt. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, oh, where's my thing? Oh, it's weird. Do I have to click on it? Oh, there we go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please interrupt. I would love it if you interrupted. Thank you. Yeah, that's all right. I, <laughs> we'll, we'll see whether this works. So, um, so. Assuming you may have written the Intuit email that went out, when you wrote it, did you understand and assume that whoever was receiving it was going to be receiving some tens or hundreds of others and, and mm -hmm. yes? yes, okay, one of you shaking your head yes. And you I, no, I no, 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 okay. yes, yes, no, yes, <laughs> definitely. We also intentionally waited, so we waited for a while to see what other people did um, because we wanted to see how people were approaching it. We wanted to see if there are, um, there's strategic, strategically, we wanted to know, uh, are companies going to be applying um, European rights to all of their customers? Are they just gonna be targeting the European market? Are they just gonna be messaging like, EU customers and not messaging um, US customers? Are they gonna be doing both at the same time? Um, so we kind of, we knew in advance from talking to colleagues at, and benchmarking with other companies kind of what people were doing. Um, but then also Cambridge Analytica happened, and that kind of like threw a big bomb into like all of our user plans. Um, so part of it too was waiting to see how some companies in particular who were facing a lot of pressure on that point um, address that issue in particular in their messaging. And, and, and assuming that this is just between us, what's your expectation of what percentage of people who receive something that you write will read it? I think we have metrics on that, right? Yeah. But, but in terms of like us creating, I think for me, I, I assume that email is dead. That's that's my assumption. So I, I don't think it's, we do it as a formality. And in some ways we actually um, decided not to do things through email. And we can talk about that in, in detail. And that's because um, it actually leads to confusion. And then customers call and flood our customer care hotlines. Um, and so instead of asking um, our customer uh, care people for things like, hey, I actually really need help with your product. They're asking about like legal questions that our customer our customer representatives can't answer anyways. It was also a way we made a microsite. So it was also a way to like shove people like we figured there was two classes of users, one who were just curious and one who actually were task oriented. So it's like if you are looking for this information and how to do these things, here's an email, click the link and get started. So you're welcome. Diving into the privacy policy. I'm sure you guys all saw. So this is one thing I actually would love to hear everyone in this room's thoughts because it's something that I'm actually passionate about. Um, I think privacy policies are, are horrible documents. Like, and I, I, I'm literally employed to write them. Um, but they don't, so a privacy policy is a notice that describes like, what data um, a company collects and how they use it, how they share it. Um, it, uh, actually, California kind of led the way on this practice, but now virtually every country that has a privacy law requires some sort of notice. There are different standards for notice depending on where your users are and what countries you operate in. But it's a general matter. The most important thing is that you say what you do comprehensively, all the things that you do, and that you actually do what you say. Um, so those are the most important things, generally speaking. Um, it's also one of the main ways today that customers um, can learn about what a company is doing with your data. And it's heavily relied upon um, as almost the number one user, ex like user experience for learning more information about transparency, corporate transparency, about how we use data, rightly or wrongly. So compliance, it's easy to say, but who, what does it mean and who decides that? And what does it matter to the U Do you care if you're compliant? Do you compare if your company is compliant that you're using? So are there compliance cops, compliance jail? Is someone looking for people who are out of compliance? 
when you wrote this, <laughs> I just have to tell a personal story. When I read this, I literally like, like envisioned myself behind her being like, yes, yes, there are compliance cops, there are compliance cops. They're called regulators, they're also called the plaintiff's bar. Um, and the plaintiffs here are, are lawyers that um, can take advantage of a private right of action and, and sue your company. Um, that doesn't exist in all, in all countries. Um, but otherwise, there are regulators, and regulators will definitely, uh, if, you, if they get a lot of cu uh, customer complaints or if customers are telling them, hey, you know, I'm not really comfortable with how Intuit is doing this, I'm really worried about that, then they have broad powers to come and inspect all of our things and pull up our hood and um, possibly give us very large amounts of fines or other sorts of um, consent decrees. So our challenges. So I could talk about all the different relationships we had to juggle, all the different stakeholders who had their, you know, they wanted their say, they have their things to protect, keeping the company in compliant, but our focus at Intuit has always been on the customers. So how do we make this simple for our users? And then Brad Smith, our CEO, has a famous quote, do not let your lawyer write your copy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it would have been easy if we just started on like, here's a front page and here's an introduction to GDPR and Intuit and what you can do at Intuit with your data. But we really had this tricky flow that we had to start with first. So we sort of backed our way in and with the deletion process. And it's the right to be forgotten, which means that you can tell Intuit, forget all my data, blow everything away, forget me, I won't have a login anymore, you don't get a right to use my data for your AI or your ML anymore. That's right. Yeah. So when you're gone, you're really, really gone, and no company wants to lose business or the data they've gotten for that business. But if they want to leave, we want to be helpful. So we had to tell a story. They were the heroes, and their data belonged to them. So we were their helpful friend, and if they wanted to leave, that we'd make sure they did it in a tidy fashion, that wouldn't leave any loose ends, because this is financial accounting software, and that's kind of a big deal. So just like we do helpful and friendly onboarding with our product, we would do helpful and friendly offboarding. And that story set the tone for the rest of the site. So how do you take a law and make it into a user flow? And basically, it's a lot of talking, and a lot of talking, and building relationships. Relationships with our CARIF team, relationships with our engineering team, with our QA team, with our legal team, with our UX team, with our teams overseas, with the different departments that are working on different parts of the flow that might not even know that we were working on GDPR, which was the case in a couple of places. So we talked daily with everybody who was involved, even when they wanted us to stop. Um, at one point, we just locked ourselves in a room, ordered lunch for a few days, and stayed until we got it done. And we had a lot of surprises, including Cambridge Analytica, and a lot of pivots along the way. And we were constantly iterating on our designs and researching and putting them in front of users and like, what does this sound like to you? Does this sound scary? Does this sound safe? Do you trust us with your data? Do you trust us to delete it when we say we're gonna delete it? Um, so we even sent an email, I wrote it. <laughs> Um, and we just wanted to keep it brief because we knew people had been inundated by this time and we wanted to have the basic links like here's where you can find our terms and service that we're talking about here's the privacy statement and here's where you can go to do a thing which was the GDPR center that we created so legal news you don't have to like <laughs> go through all this it's just some of the things we had to deal with yeah so I guess what is really interesting with of this experience for me. Um, this is the kind of a list of all of the kind of tasks that we, we had to do. So every one of these tasks um, touched many, many teams across the company. So being able to build a team that um, can understand and make decisions by working on the, the back end and also the front end and also the legal piece all simultaneously was really important and um, also very challenging. I think one of the things that made uh, my job as a lawyer really challenging is everyone always wants to know, okay, well, I, don't, I don't care about the law, just tell me what I need to do. Like, what <laughs> do I need to do? And sometimes I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know because no one has done this before. So we get, and, and as we saw, even with benchmarking with all of our, uh, the companies that we benchmark with, um, a lot of times like they wouldn't, they wouldn't know what they're gonna do. So anytime that you're presented with a privacy challenge, I would encourage you to be um, really confident in knowing that there is no right or wrong answer, that everyone is making it up, 
and that it is a chance for every person, like no matter what your role, to be heavily influential in the user experience. What's really cool too about, about the work that we do here at Silicon Valley is that um, we're really leading the way in so much of the user experience. Um, now Europe is, is pushing the political agenda and pushing the, politi pushing the politics and the regulation and the, the legal requirements, but the companies here are the ones that are really feeling the heat, even more so than companies that are just solely based in Europe. So we have the ability not only to shift uh, with our work that we do in the user experience, not only to kind of shift and set the tone um, for our users in Europe, but also shift and set the tone for the globe. It's a really exciting space to be in. Um, and uh, anyone, literally anyone, can, can make an influence globally in, in, this, in this field today. Innovation. Yay. <laughs> so, like she was saying, it's a brand new world, but it's not quite the Wild West. So there's a ton of marketing, in oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, so uh, if a customer of Intuit outside of the EU was to ask, I want the same GDPR rights, you automatically default to yes? No, not right now. Okay. Um, that's something that we're exploring. Um, so this is, that's actually a really excellent question. So that, so there's some companies that out the get go have decided to, to apply GDPR rights across the board. Um, what that mean can be, can be challenging because it also, it also, it doesn't affect just the user experience on the front end. It also affects like downstream effects of what you do with data. Um, so almost you have to get unilateral and uh, alignment across your entire organization, depending on how you use data. Um, so at Intuit, we don't have a lot of silos um, for our data. We, we try to have a, an open sharing of data to promote innovation. And because of that, that means that it's harder for us to have a siloed experience. Um, so we, we have done what we can for just for May 25, and now the next round, we're actually calling it phase two, is um, figuring out our large global approach of how we'll have uniformly use data across, across the globe. So in, in implementation of that, if a non-EU customer was to want those GDPR rights, is that, um, is that going to be technically challenging? Or yes, is okay. yeah, and that's, the main, and that's the main reason too. So part of this too is also understanding and balancing resources. Um, I think we even talked about this a little bit. Um, if, for instance, so um, there's a lot of requirements under the GDPR. One of the most onerous ones from a technical implementation perspective is the right to be forgotten, the right to delete. Um, some of it is a policy reason, meaning like you can't just, for us, for instance, it's really hard to anonymize data under GDPR standards. So um, for us, it means we actually have to delete all data, all data, um, which is really complicated. And um, from a policy perspective, not everyone in the company, and every company I've ever worked at or advised for, I've never seen unilateral agreement on that, on that principle. Um, some people think retaining data as much as possible is really important, and some think that, oh no, if someone really wants to be deleted, we should, we should honor their request. So one, it's finding that, that implementation and making sure policy-wise everyone agrees. From a technical standpoint, um, it's making sure it's not just our systems, but it's all third-party systems, and how it flows into any vendors or partners that we have as well. Um, so it, it's a broad-reaching um, requirement. And that's just one of the rights there's many, many other rights that also fall, fall, um, flow through. So part of it, of the analysis, is making sure, one, everyone agrees, but also that we're making the right choices for our customers, and then making sure that resource-wise, it's we're spending our time and our money um, in the right way. How do you deal with nested information? Do you have cases where, for example, you were asked to delete some information about a user which was related to another user? Like in a family tax or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it, we do have that situation, namely in QuickBooks, um, because QuickBooks, there's multiple users using the same product. So there's some decisions that, Part of that is, is interesting because um, there's gray on how that, gray in the law on how you should treat that, right? Because you don't want to delete someone's data if it's, well, okay, let's use a use case. You put a photo on Facebook. That Facebook photo is also maybe tagged for someone else, and now someone else also has that photo. If it means to delete, a, what does it mean to delete the photo? 
do you only delete it in the instance for the person who wants to be deleted, or do you, do, or do you delete both instances because the original person who submitted the photo, is it their photo? Is it both people's photos? Like, are you gonna run biometric software on the photo to determine who's in the photo to see if they have the rights? Of, and so it goes, it's a stem of, of questions about how you handle it. Add into it, um, when we get into a grays like that, we fall back on our principles. So we're a very principle-based organization and part of the role for GDPR was to establish certain principles of what we thought was right. Um, so the custom, we believe there's a few things about shared data that's important. One, we look at the harm. Like what, what would the harm be if we deleted the data? So because we have someone's accounting records, would it, or employee records, would it cause the individual who's request, like would it cause someone, for instance, to fall out of compliance with a law because we chose to delete data on behalf of an individual user? So um, that's part of, of the fact. There's many factors that we dive into. Typically, we want to make sure that the user experience is, is balanced between all users and also that we, if it came down to a choice between what Intuit wants and what a customer wants, the customer always wins. And that principle is firmly established. I hope that answers your question. Not at all. No, no it doesn't <laughs> answer it at all. It, it depends on the situation. So it, like factually, it depends on the situation because it, it depends on like who the users are and what the data is. Because in the case like with, with Facebook, yep. yeah, it, it, in, it, for a picture it's kind of difficult to, to tell who owns that, especially if there are more people. But in, in a finance case, I think it's pretty clear, right? So it's this person's accounting info and his whatever wife and his family. So if let's say the person deletes or one of the people wants to delete that, then you have the whole tax somehow built together. How do you deal with that? So um, for business, so we have some data as personal data, we have some data that's not, that's business data. Um, for business data and for, for account ownership, the person who, we have a concept called master admin of the account, and the master admin has the ability to control that. Uh, so they can delete, nuke the whole, uh, whole account. Where it gets a little bit more tricky, the more difficult use case, is when a customer who is a master admin sends an invoice to one of their clients. The client logs in, they both have a copy of the invoice. Whose per the invoice is of an individual and an individual's business and their service, so it's considered personal information in the EU. Like, who then, what do we do with the invoice? Do we delete all copies of the invoice? Do we keep the invoice? Uh, we, we delete the full account for the master admin who's requested it, but if the, um, which may include all of the data for everyone underneath them. Um, if the end user who received that invoice also has their own account, then, then they may keep the invoice. If they don't, then it would go away with the master admin. Um, yes, but, but it depends. Can you repeat yeah. that question because we missed it on the mic? Shannon? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. I think what you're, I'm sorry. Can you? Yes. Thank so, you. So if, Thank you, you. if you delete a part of your like invoice, as you said, then the totals, for example, w may be affected also, right? Um, no, I don't think that that is a result that we would ever have. No. No. I, that's not something that would end up in our product like based on, on, on how we set, set it up. Yep. I'm just curious if, a, let's say, a French person went and saw a doctor in America and they're running QuickBooks, so the invoice is for the French person. Like, if they went to remove their record because it's personal health data, like, how do you hold that? Like, you still, as that doctor, would want that transaction. So do you just, like, XXX the patient may not, or how do you hold your business, you know what I'm saying? You still have billed someone's insurance for $500 and you wanna hold that in your books, that accounting. So you're asking a great question, okay. which is not only, do we, not only do we have our obligations to think of, like how does Intuit need to comply with the law, but also how do our customers need to comply with the law? Um, so we do have instructions on, on how they can remove data um, and then we're working on building more automated features so that it's much easier for them moving forward. I'm gonna recognize Hannah on the phone. <laughs> And let's see if we can pull her up. Awesome. Go ahead. 
You're on now. Hannah. Yes, you're ready, Hannah. You can now. Uh, oh, cool. I, I can't hear anything that the audience is saying. So anything other than what, um, what Jen and Shannon were saying, I can't really hear. Um, we'll repeat the questions for you. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Um, the, I, I totally concur with, um, with most of what, what they were saying. Um, it's a little different for, I'm sorry, I should probably introduce myself. So um, I'm Hannah Petit, and I am the uh, Privacy Counsel at GitHub. GitHub is a social coding company. Um, so we have not only uh, companies that use us, but also individual users. So it's a, a little different when you're dealing with um, not just you know, an organization who might be in Europe, but also individuals who could be all over the, the world. Um, and because of that, we made the decision a long time ago, really before we even started looking at GDPR, that we were going to apply the same privacy standards to everyone, regardless of whether they were a European citizen or a US citizen or you know, someone from, Jap from Japan who might be traveling, who might be, we don't know where they are. We don't ask what their location is, so we don't know. So the easiest thing for us to do was to apply the same privacy standards globally. Um, because we did this at an early stage, it was very easy for us to kind of translate that into GDPR and, and start, a, start to apply GDPR um, to everyone rather than, as, as you all were talking about, siloing data. Um, it gets, it, it's a decision you have to make early on, whether you're going to group people over here and apply these, um, these sets of uh, rules to these people and these sets of rules to these people or whether you're going to aim for a really high bar for everyone. It's, they're both really hard decisions. Um, so as we were preparing for GDPR, fortunately we, we'd already aimed for the high bar. Um, and we started building um, our privacy rules in a way that we could apply to everyone. Um, you were all right that the thing to really tackle is the right to erasure, the right to be forgotten, the right to deletion. Um, fortunately, though, that has a lot of um, a lot of limitations at the outset, and then a lot of um, exceptions. So um, this is going to be a little confusing for those of our, who are not already big privacy nerds, but um, Europe looks at data controllers and data processors. If you're a controller, you are the person who is asking for the data. You are the person who um, chooses what to do with the data once you have it. If you are a processor, you're just holding the data. You're not doing anything with it until a controller tells you to do something. So you're like Dropbox. You just hold it. You don't do anything with it, you don't look at it, you don't mess with it, you just hold it. So the right to be forgotten only applies to controllers, doesn't apply to processors. Also, it only applies to data that's processed on the basis of consent. GDPR require, or sets forth um, six legal bases for processing data. You decide I'm going to process this data on the basis of consent. So I'm going to ask you for it, and you're going to give it to me with your consent. Or I'm going to process it on the basis of a contract. We agree that I'm going to provide you services, and um, in order to provide you services, I have to have your data, I have to have your signature on this contract. So I can process your data because I have to have your signature on this contract. You can't come to me and say, right to be forgotten, I want you to forget everything about me. I have to have your signature on this contract. 
I have to know who you are in order to be able to continue. I have to know who you are. And there's a couple others. There's, you know, compliance with regulatory obligations, and there's a business's legitimate, legitimate purposes. But there's a couple other things that a business can be doing with data that have nothing to do with consent. Most businesses are um, processing data on the basis of consent. You know, you go to Facebook and Facebook says, hey, you know, tell us what you did today. You write your post and you've consented to give them that information. Um, fortunately for us, we ask for a very small amount of data, so we're not processing a lot on the basis of consent. For other businesses, they're going to have different challenges. So for us, it was super easy to figure out, here's the data we have, here's how we're processing it. Everyone's going to need to, as they're you know, looking into GDPR, figure out what, what their data is and then why they're processing it, why they're holding it. Are you a controller? Are you a, just a processor? And why did you ask for that data in the first place? Because different rules apply depending on why you have it. So going back to sort of the point here, as we're building our privacy policy in preparation for GDPR, we're trying to communicate to our users, here is exactly what we have about you. Here is exactly why you gave it to us. If there's a reason that you don't think we should have it anymore, if you gave it to us and forgot that you gave it to us and you don't want us to have it, here's how you can delete that data. If we still need it to process your service or for security reasons or for regulatory reasons, we'll tell you that. So it was actually pretty easy to make that clear for us. Again, different companies are going to have different obstacles. Um, uh, Jen and Shannon talked about um, when they released their privacy statement. We released ours a month early um, and let people know um, a month early that we were about to update ours. And one of the things that we do is we open source our terms of service and our privacy statement. So we have a repository on GitHub where people can go and give us feedback and comment and make suggestions. So for a month before May 25th, we had an open, repos uh, uh, an open pull request um, inviting our user community to give us suggestions. And it was, it was great to have that dialogue with our community and being our privacy statement, know that they were holding us to task. And it was, it was very rewarding. That's what I've got. Cool. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. I'm just trying to think if we've done that, like, let everybody have to <laughs> say it's kind of terrifying at the same time. <laughs> Completely terrifying. More controlled yes. manner, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to take another question now, or do you want to uh, finish some of the presentation? Sure, we could we could do either. I'm just trying to find the presentation again. Totally happy I'm with sorry, questions. Yeah. <laughs> like, a lot of things go. happening. Okay. Allow me to offer a question from the audience. And and Hannah, Thank like you. also just jump in. Yeah. Just yeah. Jump in. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, yeah, we will repeat them for you. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. So the question was, um, after GitHub got acquired by Microsoft, did they have to change their privacy policies with respect to GDPR and their regular uh, privacy policies? So can you hear me, Hannah? Thank you. Hannah? Yes, I can hear you. OK. Uh, the question is, uh, and. Uh, I hope I get this correct, so correct me if I get it wrong, um, is after GitHub was acquired by Microsoft, how did that affect your requirements to change your privacy policies? Is that right? Is that accurate? Yeah. Yep. I knew this was coming. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 
so the acquisition hasn't happened yet. Um, they've announced the purchase, but there's, there's for any kind of thing like this, there's a long um, period where the various regulatory agencies have to look at both companies and decide if there are any antitrust issues, and that takes months. Um, but um, let's see how much I can tell you. Um, as they were looking at us, they, they spent a long time looking at um, our GDPR work, our privacy policy work, and they came away pretty happy with it. They haven't asked us to make any changes to our privacy policy. That's a good sign. Can I? I'm happy with it. <laughs> yeah, one more. Uh, can I, do I need a mic to, oh, maybe, I'm, maybe I am mic. She might be able to hear you. I may be already mic'd, cool. Um, so uh, I, uh, I worked at Apple for many years, so I, I'm not there now, so I'm not representing them, but one of the things that was clear to me is in the development of products, we would frequently use information data from customers and that would go into the development of algorithms, that would go into the development of actual products. Um, it wasn't just a repository, it was actually part of the design decisions. Um, and so I know working with engineers, the idea that we couldn't, that they couldn't have access to this information would not go down well. Um, and, and simply saying that the lawyers said we can't do this was a good reason for the lawyers never to be invited back to the meetings again where the decisions were being made. Maybe Sounds had, right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so uh, have you guys thought about this and how you approach this? Yes, I'm seeing a head shaking from Hannah, so I'll let you start, but I'm guessing the folks at Intuit probably use information from your customers to help optimize the development of your own products. Yep, so. we do. Thanks. That goes back, for us, it goes back to the relationship building again. And like, we will be here and we will invite ourselves to your meeting. And sometimes you had to be a bad cop. And that's true. You know, that's just the way it is. But it's a relationships and building it and just the trust. Like it took a while, I think, for them to like, oh, she knows what she's talking about. We should oh. listen to her. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Hannah, you wanna jump in and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump in after you from a legal perspective. Sure. Sure. It's funny because uh, this afternoon I was having lunch with um, the woman that used to be the director of our data al analytics program, and I tried to invite her to come speak with me at this. Um, it is absolutely relationship building. Um, it's funny because often you think about privacy attorneys and the two groups they're never going to get along with are data analytics and marketing. And my best friends are data analytics and marketing. And it really just comes down to making those relationships and showing that you're not there to be a chaperone. You're not there to tell them no every time they turn around. You're there to work with them and show them that yes, they can do cool stuff. Here is the right way to do it. Here are, here's your speed limit, now go. Um, we've, so at Intuit, we, we've actually, your question I think affected probably every aspect of the way that we did our legal analysis. Everything from finding the right legal bases um, to make sure that um, our teams had the most flexibility to use data. Um, and then also the way that we, we structured ourselves. So one of the things that we did, which is a little bit um, outside of the box, um, Hannah mentioned a little bit about controller and processor. We kind of have B2B products, we kind of have B2C products, we're kind of in the middle gray area. Um, we uh, have said that we're gonna be a controller, meaning that we wanna have full flexibility to be able to use the data for product improvement. Now, um, from a user experience, what has been really important to us is really improving and understand, like really improving our transparency and how we talk about what our product is. Because um, right now, it's easy to say like, oh, we have an accounting product, but moving forward, um, it's gonna be a conversational inter interface. It's going to be financial advice. It's going to be uh, real-time geolocation tracking that understands your movements and is connected to like what you're paying for in a, in a store, at a meal. Um, so how do, you, how do you have a privacy policy or how do you begin talking about transparency um, in, those, in, in those places? Um, there's no right answer for that. I, I don't, anyone in this room could come up with the next brilliant idea, I think. Um, 
and trying to balance those experiences. I think right now one of our main goals is to really dive in deep um, with doing user testing uh, to understand real, tr like truly what our customer's marketplace expectation is. Um, and then the other side of the coin, which is not technically GDPR, um, but we're actually diving into data ethics more, more clearly on like what the ethical concerns are um, for the con like when we're building uh, our algorithms and what, what it means to have algorithm as a service and what that marketplace will look like when you have algorithms training algorithms training algorithms training algorithms and what does it mean if there is a mistake in the original algorithm that's training the other algorithms and how does that if we collect people's financial information if if we are providing you with a loan offer based on information that we received from an algorithm you know 40 algorithms ago and it's incorrect the implications to your real life are are or, or true and real. That can, that can affect your family, it can affect your business, it can affect your ability to succeed. Um, so that's a lot of what we're thinking about right now. And I'll wrap up really quick. <laughs> so, um, tons of marketing implications. Now that everybody, everything is sort of an opt-in basis in the EU, I would think that marketing strategies, campaigns would be more successful if you're measuring on open rates and maybe marketing doesn't have to sound like a needy boyfriend like please love us please really really love us so and when it comes to gdpr there's like less than 50 smees in the world right i'm gonna go with that yes okay sure all right so <laughs> and to reiterate like sounds good uh you can put that on your linkedin thank you uh, i will okay. So no one's ever really done this before, so we're just trying to do the right thing from our customers. Yeah. Oh, subject matter expert, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Facebook's public spanking was super scary. No one wants that to, to happen to them. Uh, we were told, or we assumed things were requirements that turned out not to be, like consent in some cases. Yep. Um, legacy products, really a bitch. Uh, we found a few teams that were working on the same thing product-wise because we hadn't been talking across teams and like all the calls to care just even to call and ask us like do you have a GDPR policy are you getting ready that cost us a lot of money um, financial software was meant to protect people from bad actors so it's not really meant to delete pe delete items uh, hello uh, so don't assume you'll carry a project through to deletion, to completion, deletion, completion. We were this, I was on the second team to handle this. Uh, Shannon was there from the beginning and the team sort of handed us things in increments like, oh yeah, and here's this and oh yeah, here's this. Um, so we had to sort of go back and reinvent the wheel a couple of times. That was fun. We were tasked with this and we ended up with something much more leaner and much more cleaner and much better for the customer. Do we want, do we want, is Hannah still on? Does Hannah, Hannah want to give some final thoughts? Yeah, Hannah. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And, um, and, and what you said, you sort of targeted um, the, the inter-team communication, the need for communicating across teams um, across departments and understanding what are you working on? How are you building that? How are you building privacy into that? Um, what vendors are you using? Are they compliant? Um, the huge amount of, of communication and data gathering that we've had to do, you know, I thought we communicated just fine. We're a small company and Boy, I had to do so much just legwork, just sitting down and asking all of those questions. Um, that was the bulk of, of the time it took us, just communicating and, and writing down ways that, oh, I didn't know you were working on that and you were working on that and zero people are working on that and that's a legacy system and now we have to figure out what to do. Yep. Um, and writing down, you know, okay, how are we gonna do this going forward? Building those policies. That's, that's tough, yeah. So it's, you know, there's a whole lot of GDPR that we talk about that's user facing because that's what everybody wants to hear about. But all of the stuff that's 
that's the backbone of it that's just building those those internal policies and those internal processes and um, that just keep the ongoing compliance going um, is so important. We have a question back here. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, I was uh, hoping you guys could talk a little bit about uh, anonymization and pseudonymization, uh, just sort of how you approach that and what you know some of the, the issues were for you. With fear? So, Hannah, the question is um, if we could approach, uh, or talk a little bit about our approaches to anonymization versus synonymization um, and GDPR standards and what we thought about that. Do you want yeah, to? okay, so we had extensive, <laughs> extensive, di dist extensive discussion with the developers about that. It actually, um, at the end of the day, we decided not to do anonymization um, because we thought it was the right user experience. Um, Anon also, anonymization, uh, the standard for anonymization, so just to uh, back up at a high level, um, the GDPR uh, and European regulators generally have a very strict stance on what it means to actually anonymize someone. There are uh, many thoughts um, in the like legal academia that is under their standard is um, technically impossible to properly anonymize someone. Um, so when you say, oh, we're gonna just anonymize the data, and therefore it will not be personal information, and therefore it will not be subject to the law and the requirements, including most notably the requirement to delete. Um, it's actually much, much, much more difficult um, to meet that legal standard than meets the eye. Um, we ended up taking it all the way to our executives, and our executives um, actually was a really easy decision for them because they didn't even care about the law. For them it was, you know, if, if someone wants to be deleted, let's just do it. Like, the, it, like why, like why, like why would we keep their data? Like why is that a good user experience? And also, we're lucky, we don't have like millions of our customers like asking to have their data deleted. And I think part of that means like we have a good product and we try to do right by our customers. And at the end of the day, that's what mattered. And that's the principle that we set for our designs moving forward. Anna? So following up on that, as a financial software company, oh my God, of course, you've got real problems trying to do anonymization and pseudonymization. You've got so many regulatory oversight issues with that. Well, GitHub allows pseudonymous accounts. Um, you don't have to use a real name to, to create a GitHub account, but we still consider that personal information. You have a username, you have an email address associated with it, you have an IP address associated with it. That is all personal data that can all be traced back to an individual. That's all, per you know, it doesn't matter that, yes, it's pseudonymous. Under European law, that's still personally identifying. We still consider it personal data. We still treat it with the same, um, the same high level that we would treat your real name. Next question. So I love this uh, concept of algorithms around algorithms around algorithms uh, figuring things out. Um, <coughs> each of those layer of algorithms are getting data from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we have great uh, approaches to validating the data that we're basing these things on that come from wherever they come from at all these layers or <laughs> Is that, I mean, that seems like a huge, you know, that seems like an IEEE standard kind of story, but tell me how that's thought about right now. So what is the question? So Hannah, uh, the question, I'm gonna try and re, re I hope I get this right. Um, the question is, when we're talking about like the algorithm as a service marketplace, and you have algorithms that are being used to train other algorithms that are training and so on and so forth, um, how do you think about and approach um, how data is collected from one algorithm, for instance, that will be used to train another, and how do you think through the building of algorithms and the building of, say, machine learning and neural network, net networks and all that fun stuff? Even a little simpler yeah. is each uh, of these algorithms simpler. is gonna collect its data somehow, and I kind of imagine that there's some, some validation for each algorithm of it's got data that's legal, and once you have layers of them, how do you validate that your data you're basing everything on is legal still? Oh, uh, so 
so I think there's a couple of things to unpack. I'm, I'm gonna, so it's even simpler than what I explained. <laughs> Sorry, I, I hope I'm doing a good job translating here. Um, but how do you make sure that the data that is being used in an algorithm is legal? And I think also, I think you also mean the result, the result of an algorithm. So um, it kind of, so I am not a data scientist, and Hannah may know more about this than I do. And actually, there's, I'm sure there's people in this room that know like way more about this than I do. Um, I can tell you that as a general high level, um, there's ways to approach, uh, there's, so generally speaking, we try to have guardrails about what data can be used for what purposes, as a, just as a general principle within our organization. Um, and I kind of recommend that maybe for most, most companies to think through that. Um, with algorithms themselves and with, with AI, um, it kind of depends on what the algorithm is doing. And so um, one of the things that we're exp experimenting with right now is like restrictions on what you do to train an algorithm and then also how you can use an algorithm to score. So they're not necessarily, some algorithms score and train at the same time, some just are used for training, some are just used for scoring. Um, and so it kind of depends on how the algorithm is structured and also what results you're trying, what you're trying to achieve. So there's algorithms that can cut through, that, that can give you like a yes or no, like, hey, is this a cat? Yes or no, like cat, cat, elephant, cat, cat, cat. And then there's other things that actually are way more complex and can cut through data more system, systematically. Those are the ones that I think maybe uh, are a little bit more tricky. Um, I, I don't think anyone has the right answer when I speak to a lot of the data scientists that I work with. Um, notably, it can be a challenge because we often don't know what data is relevant. And often, even if you remove the data that you don't know, so for, let's say, for instance, you, you are producing a uh, algorithm that uh, is gonna run some sort of promotion, and you don't want that promotion to be based on someone's race. If you remove race, like now there's, there's statistical evidence to show that if you remove race from the factor that's used to train the algorithm, over time, the algorithm actually will train itself to include race as a factor, so that even by the, the even by removing it, that you're you're actually not getting the result that you're trying to achieve. You're not. You're actually, it actually is using race incidentally to train the algorithm. Um, so now I guess I, I'm. There's now I think current thought on actually you should just include everything. I don't know, but Hannah, do you have any other thoughts? No, and this is fascinating to listen to. Um, we do um, a good deal of machine learning, but because of the nature of our service, we're not doing machine learning on personal data. We're doing machine learning on the code that is in repositories. And because we have a lot of confidentiality uh, you know, requirements around, we've got uh, public repositories and private repositories, and so Anything in public repositories, we can do a, a lot of um, machine learning on. Anything in private repositories, the, the owners of that repository have to ask us to do it on their, on their data. But we're not doing it on, um, on personal data. We're doing it on, on the code that we host. So um, a, lot of these, um, a lot of these issues are, to me, mostly theoretical. Um, we do some studies on um, who is using GitHub and who is active in open source communities. And that's where we start getting into race and gender and whether or not you are a minority in the country where you live. Um, but we're doing very little machine learning on that. It's, that's, all, that's all individuals you know, individuals in our data science team actually looking at the data, making human decisions. To answer your question, I think more point blankly, I don't think anyone today really knows how to put proper guardrails in place to, to make, ensure that everything is done legally. And I think also ethically, because the, the law is not, is, AI is gonna move so much faster than the law is gonna move. So I think data ethics is gonna become more and more important as, as we dive into that. Um, there are guardrails that we put in place, there are principles that we put in place, um, and we work very closely with our, our our tech teams, but um, I think there's still a lot to be learned, and we're, I think Silicon Valley will make many, many, many mistakes before we, we, 
figure out the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hannah, 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 go. Hannah, what you doing? Oh. <laughs> Mini stars. What? No, I was just face palming because you're so right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi. So, um, working in a startup, it sounds like non-compliance actually might be a pretty decent strategy, considering four percent of gross revenue is not going to be as much as legal fees. Love this guy. So, <laughs> is that what you want your reputation to be? So Ooh, uh, <laughs> look at you! That's all right, such a good so answer. I'm curious. Like, obviously, with limited resources, being compliant is can be a little bit more challenging, but like that's the end goal. But what what would you advise a startup to do? Be compliant. It, just, just because, like, I mean, it just was an off the cuff quip, but like your your reputation is kind of everything, especially in the valley. Like you have to be known as an impeccable actor. Otherwise, why do people want to do business with you? Why do we want to bring you aboard to our business if we're buying Investing. your stuff? So. Reputation carries a lot of weight, and relationships are the key. So it's it's if you can at least try to be the best compliance you can be, you know, do the best, then that's a really good show of faith. Uh, legal, legal. So I didn't I didn't actually hear the question, but oh, just so. just gauging from no, please don't feel bad. Just gauging from the um, from the answer. Um, one of the things that I say all the time is that I don't fear the regulators. I fear our customers. And if we get anything wrong, I'm going to hear from our customers. I'm going to hear it really loudly because they are very outspoken. And I don't want to put a foot wrong. I, I want our customers to be incredibly happy with everything that we do. Like I said, we've got all of these um, open source ways for our customers to communicate with us, and it's all public. So if I screw it up, it's going to be public, and it's going to be, it's going to be in the press, and it's going to be incredibly embarrassing. I want to get it perfect. I actually think your question is really smart, and, um, and it's one that I often get behind closed doors. So I think you should be uh, proud of yourself for thinking that way. Um, I will say for a startup, most startups run lean, right? Like they can't do everything. That's, a, that's an actual reality. And so making sure that you have your priorities, understanding where your risks are, and also really understanding what matters to your customers. And not the one thing that I see that startups do that I think is a mistake is that because they think something is cool, they undermine what the real marketplace expectation is for customers. There's also a couple of there's also a couple, a couple of um, more than a couple of a handful of companies here in the in Silicon Valley that their privacy strategy for a very long time was to take as much much risk as possible and fund their litigation uh, pools very heavily. I will say they made a lot of mistakes. They got to benefit from that strategy. Um, you will not see the same sorts of benefits because that's already been done. So regulators already, already know the answers. They're already prepared to handle those types of mistakes. And most importantly, customers already are prepared. Like, they already have their response for those types of, of mistakes that happened in the past. Also, you worked for Apple. I think Apple, notably, has really come out with a very, very strong privacy response. Um, I think Apple had the strongest customer statement that I saw to date about GDPR about saying that we believe as, as an organization that privacy is a fundamental human right. I, I don't think I've seen any other company come out and make that statement. And I think that's the reason I use Apple products. I think it, 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 it builds trust in a way, like you're playing the long game at that point, right? Like rather than like making shortcuts for resources, you're, you're building trust for the, for the make sure that your customers will continually buy your products and, and have brand loyalty. I actually don't have a question. I want to add to that because um, I was invited to speak because I'm a lawyer and I can do some advice and counseling on this along these lines too, but I declined because I keep getting startups and startups come to me with like, oh my God, I have no money. What do I need to do? And when you run the analysis, well, are, do you technically need to comply? The answer may be no, so maybe it doesn't make sense from a budgetary perspective to dot all the I's now. 
But at the same time, um, all this advice about your customers will care is absolutely true. Um, building, even if you don't comply in terms of the letter of the law, all of this advice is talking about privacy by design and how important it is and that these horror stories about we went and we found the old stuff that we had to still support and it was really hard to re-engineer good privacy practices in that means that at least even if you're not technically doing everything that the regulation requires, you should be engineering your products consistent with these principles because the customers expect it. And I wanna echo something else that Hannah said, which is, because there was a question about the buyer. And the buyer is going to look at your company and wonder what kind of trouble they are attempting for themselves. If you can show them, look, we've been very good. We've done the best we can. We have everything in order as well as we could do it. Um, you know, especially for your startup, that's probably your exit strategy of getting bought. So putting in the time now, you will probably see the value later on by actually having done something, even though it is an upfront cost right now. It will probably cost you more down the road in terms of your value as a target company to be acquired if the buyer is like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And you can take a look at Verizon trying to buy Yahoo and see exactly how much that value dropped when they looked at all of Yahoo's privacy problems. Or, or Uber, right? Well, yeah. I mean, Uber got in a lot of trouble, a lot of it for privacy reasons and for being very flippant about, about regulation generally and compliance. And um, CEO lost his job, the investors started suing each other, board members started suing each other. Uh, it, yeah, they, and they, they have a lot of money, so they can probably, they're gonna weather the storm, but most, not, most companies are not Uber with their valuation. Yeah, the thing you will discover when you exit is something called due diligence, where your buyer is going to take a look, they're gonna wanna look at all your agreements, all of this, all of that, they're gonna scrutinize your company. And I don't know if that many buyers right now are completely doing it, but I would expect that wave to come soon, that buyers will be looking and they're going to ask you some very pointed questions about, okay, what have you done on this front? And you're gonna wanna have a good answer. Especially if they're buying you for your data. Because then, if you have, if if it's, if if you if you collected it and there's no protections, then the, it's worthless. So. Speaking as someone who has who is currently in the process of being acquired, yes, that's super super important. Yes, they ask, they care, they scrutinize it very heavily. Um, and I'll go back to something that I said very early in this conversation. Um, we made decisions very early in the company's life cycle to treat all of our users um, the same regardless of where they lived. That was, a, that was a very early product decision that paid off immensely when GDPR came along. Um, it, the costs for us for implementing GDPR were drastically reduced because we had made good privacy decisions years ago. So it's, it's kind of one of those things that when you, if you are a small startup or if you are just getting going along, if you can, um, if you can make those privacy decisions early before you have too much baggage, oh my gosh, it pays off. It, it pays off in how much easier things are five years down the road, 10 years down the road, it's just so much easier and you have so little remediation to do. Oh, I've got one more thing if I could just jump in. Um, you may not be exposed to Europe right now, but guess what? California is writing its own privacy regulation. Uh, we won't go into the nightmare that that is, but you're not gonna be able to escape California telling you what to do for your privacy stuff. So it's good practice to get on board with you know, trying to be as tidy and ethical about these things as you can, because ultimately that does seem to be what the baseline is going to be. You don't want to be the low hanging fruit of somebody who's done something really egregious. Don't be the next Cambridge Analytica. That is not what you want to be. Stay as far away from that as you can, um, because you don't, your business decision about why you would want to do something that's going to tempt that sort of maelstrom, you better have a good answer. And I don't know what kind of answer would actually be that good. And it's 
Ka even, uh, Kathy, if that is you, I swear to God, do not get me started about the new California law. <laughs> no, don't get me started either. Yes. And it's even been part of a story arc on Silicon Valley when the Hulu company bought a messaging app that didn't have the correct privacy things. Many of us cringed. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm, I'm just looking around if there's somebody new who hasn't had a chance to speak yet. And here's one, a first time Bake High attendee. Hi. Hi, my name is Shane, and I'm a current uh, a British, uh, research assistant at Stanford University. It's my first time speaking here. And I uh, so much appreciate your guys' uh, insight. And I think it's, well, I have um, this gentleman has asked a question that I just uh, have been add on to the thought is uh, how the algorithm is, um, how the algorithm to, uh, to regulate the data. And uh, sorry, I got a little nervous. <laughs> um, so I can, s my research uh, direction is about how our next generation's learning technology in, um, in the linguistic basis. Cool. So I was thinking in, in AI and machine learning is the learning speed is, I think, in reality is really, really fast, like uh, over human capacity. So I was looking for what, what uh, the data can help us to improve how our, our learning um, in general. And I can see the impact and consequence for the whole society is our marvelously. So uh, yeah, and the persuasive design is of often helpful, and um, I see the downside of it, and I want to see how, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about it? Thanks. So I think you've hit the nail on the head about like large, a large philosophical con like concept of how do we build technology in a way that um, allows us to use data as a society in a flexible way to improve society, but at the same time also balance like the individual and the role of the individual. It's such a timely question. As actually, governments are grappling with this and people are on different sides. So in Europe, for instance, we've been talking about GDPR, and they're coming out on the side that the individual, the individual should trump and the individual should be able to control their data no matter what, even if it's um, in circumstances where the public maybe could benefit from from or uh, from the data being used, or um, even if the record may be in the public, for instance, it may be have to, ha being maybe required to be removed, even um, even if there's like a, a, a value generally to the public. Um, there are other places like here in the U.S., although California has noted um, that it's not always it's it's not always so clear about where we stand in society about how we want to use data. Um, I think I really hope you encourage. I really hope you go forward with your research and keep working on that, because no one has the answer to these questions. No one, and and everyone right now could be a thought leader in this space, like depending on on how you feel and about the work that you're doing. So I, I encourage you to to be a thought leader and think about how you, how using personal information would benefit the algorithm in society, but also how might you um, balance that with an individual's need? What if someone was, you're, you're, you work on lin linguistics? Like what if someone was sensitive to the way that, that their voice sounded? Maybe it was too high or maybe they have a speech impediment and maybe um, they're walking in a public space and that, infer like maybe you're collecting data in a public space where people are talking, right? Because in America, Often, data that's collected in public spaces is not as protected as data in, in private spaces. Um, what does that mean for that individual? If we have algorithms that train other algorithms, is it, could it get back to them in some way, then tied to them in some way? And that may be what you're forced to grapple with as you, as you work on these algorithms yourself. Right. Uh, I know some of the colleagues who also work in Apple and Facebook. So uh, we can see that Facebook makes some compromise lately. And they said the new feature of uh, secret conversations that my boyfriend had <laughs> has with other girls. Wow. Uh, so I recognize it's a vacuum zone for you know the privacy and and increasing the impact is not just personal and 
so I was seeing the, the conditions for what you have saying. I will definitely work on it. It's like the uh, connotation recognition and like these kinds of um, data is, is collectible like for Siri, for example, like these servers, for party servers. And by recognize it, right now we don't have a really good algorithm can utilize and also uh, optimize it. Optimize it. So I was thinking to more so more other people's perspective. Right. Thank you. Um, are are you visiting? Are do you are you from America by any chance? I'm a new immigrant, so I just came here uh, five years. No, no, no. I'm only I'm only asking uh -huh. because I think um, what will be such a blessing to your work, at least I would be so interested in learning okay. about it personally, is uh -huh. is how um, culturally there may be differences between like like where um, wherever you're from and and, uh, and what people around you at, um, would feel as opposed to like here or at Stanford or at Facebook. And then even like in, in other locations in, in this country and, and abroad, um, I find that some, to be some of the most interesting work that I end up doing, and I'm, I'm curious how that might be. Right, I hear a more neutral, um, neutral voice from the whole worldwide, not just in the United States. So I find that it's very hard, and I re was really attracted by what you was mentioned, ethical concerns. Because uh, we're humans, as a designer, as a researcher, we are not always being neutral, even though we try to. So I recognize, um, yeah, I don't have a really good answer for this. But any, but anyhow, I'm <laughs> I'm trying to be not offensive um, for for the race. This kind of question. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a great question. Thank you. So, uh, do you feel like you've completed? Mm -hmm. Whoop. Yes. Yeah. But look at the clouds. Was the last one. Okay. <laughs> and okay, and uh, does everybody here feel like they've asked all the public questions they want to ask? One more. Okay. Why don't you be the last public question, and then we will uh, dissolve the big meeting, and you can come up and discuss things directly with the speakers. Thanks. So, uh, last question that I just wanted to ask was uh, if you have any recommendations of. Um, resources uh, that uh, we could consult uh, for clarification on um, like different specific aspects of GDPR uh, and in terms of like interpreting how our own business practices relate to some of the principles and the processes that are described uh, in you know the regulations. Uh, any recommendations would be awesome. <laughs> are you a lawyer? Yeah. No, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm curious what you think, because you're a non-lawyer. <laughs> uh, so I was, th there is a, there is sort of a UX GitHub type thing that is a really good place to get questions about that. I'm just, I'm blanking on the name of it. You can find it. You okay. can find it to me. Yeah. But it, it's sort of like GitHub, but for UX designers and product designers. And they're probably talking about it. That sounds perfect. There's, there's also uh, like public regu uh, regulators have, um, notably the ICO in the UK, which is the privacy regulator. Um, their website has a lot of um, tools that businesses can look at and read. But I was going to mention that one too. So that's the uh, ICO is Information Commission uh, Office, right? I think, yes. I think that's right. Anyway, and it's in the UK and they have a very big specialized website with a lot of detail. I hope it's useful to you, but it may be more useful for companies in the UK. I'm not sure. Uh, that, but it's in English, so that's why I point to that one. <laughs> There's other regulators that have also issued their own, but um, you may need to, to translate them um, or use like Google Translate and figure it out. But I, I will say this, and I know I'm not just saying this because I'm a lawyer. I highly, GDPR is really complicated, and privacy is not easy. And it's a novel space, and there's a lot going on. So if you have the budget, I would highly recommend like speaking with an expert in the space because it's it's it, not all of it is uh, even if you were to just read the whole law, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to understand everything um, unless you've done extensive extensive work on European privacy. Oh, and Hannah, 
He was asking if there were any recommendations on resources on resources to understand GDPR. Mm, I, I, the sound cut out for me for a bit, so I don't know what Shannon said. Um, but my favorite re resources are um, IAPP put out a really good guideline on the operational impacts of GDPR and then operationalizing GDPR. It's, uh, it's some deep stuff, but they do a really good job of breaking it down into plain English. And that's the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> well, let's thank our two speakers who are present with us, Hannah, who's remote, and our standby attorney, Robin Goldstein. And we'll see you back here next month uh, for Alan Cooper's ne next visit to Bakai. Second Tuesday evening. Um, and just for, for this stuff, I think um, that this session was recorded. Yes. Um, yes, this question has been recorded. And, I, and we will be processing it for distribution as soon as we can. <laughs>